Kyle Brownrigg. Oh, wow, Kyle yeah. oh, Brownrigg. Funny, funny guy. Well, I've heard really great things about no, him. You should. Th this guy is going to be a star. Huh. Yeah. What's your proof? Well, like, first of all, he's open for Jeff Ross. Hello. Oh, okay. uh, secondly, he has won the award for Ottawa's least worst comic. Okay, least worst comic? It's humor, Allison. It means new, best new comic. Oh, okay. I bet he's not as funny as you, though, huh? No, he's not. What? <laughs> that... I bet he is. Let's go meet him. No, wait a second. <laughs> Kyle, yes. welcome to the show. Kyle Brown. Oh my gosh. <laughs> uh, it is awesome to have you here. Yes. Thank you for having me. I, I can say um, that I've, I've now seen you perform a number of times and uh, honest to God, I, 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 I cry when I laugh. <laughs> I laugh so hard. <laughs> so you had better be damn funny today because <laughs> if you're not, you know. Reputation uh, on the it's line. I can't make any promises. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> You're, you're a stand-up comic, yeah. and yeah. obviously you write you write your own stuff, right? Like it's all of it. Yep, except for the stuff that I steal. That yeah, yeah that is the rest. Of it. But the rest is mine. Okay, for the yeah. most part. Yeah. You know what? I heard this great. I don't know if you'd call it a quote, but there are more people that would rather be thrown into a lion's den than actually have to do stand-up comedy, and I would put myself in that category. I could not imagine doing stand-up comedy. Well, it's interesting. A lot of people say that because uh, they say the number one fear is public speaking. Right. Right. For me, like, my number one fear is, like, going and having to speak with my aunt. <laughs> That's my number one fear. Like, I, I have no problem with going up and embarrassing myself and being totally vulnerable on stage to thousands of strangers. Yeah. But, like, wow. a lot of little things that yeah. a lot of people would, f like, even just having to get to work on time, mm -hmm. like, I'm... I'm sweating buckets. Yeah. I have so much anxiety and like, yeah. But yet you can stand up in front of a crowd of a thousand people and and, and do make an routine. ass out of myself and not care. Wow. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Where, where, where does that come from? Like, yeah. why why do you think it's like that? And has it always been uh, that way? Just a. Uh, it's because I'm a millennial and uh, <laughs> we're just told that we're great all the time and oh. we always get the participation trophy. Right. So <laughs> I'm just swimming in narcissism every day. I. Uh, uh, no, I don't know. I mean, uh, my uh, family was always very funny, and we always sort of gravitated towards stand-up, and uh, my father's favorite stand-up comedian is Mike McDonald, uh, Ottawa, uh, can Ottawa and Canadian icon, mm -hmm. yeah. um, and uh, I leaned more towards, like, female comics, and uh, I always just watched it growing up. I don't know. We always just gravitated towards it. I can't explain it. It was just always there. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Do you remember writing your first joke? Or what yeah, it was. It was, uh, it was terrible. It was uh, the first set that I ever did. I thought that it was the funniest thing that anybody had ever heard. And like, watch out, you get to meet me. Like, you're welcome. <laughs> but uh, it didn't go over uh, like too poorly. But the first joke that I ever wrote was I was like, okay, you guys. I know that when you look at me, you're like, oh my god, this guy's obviously handsome. <laughs> It, that's the reaction it got, and <laughs> it uh, didn't go over very well. Um, but that was that was the first joke I ever wrote. Wow. So when did you know? I mean, like, it, like when did you start doing stand-up comedy in front of people? That kind of thing. When well, did this you is, commit to that. Yeah. This it's funny. This is going to sound really cheesy, and uh, uh, but I I do really agree with uh, her words. So Joan Rivers mm -hmm. once said that. You don't choose stand-up comedy. Uh, stand-up comedy chooses you. you. Interesting. Okay. And the only way that I can make sense of that is like just like I'm saying, like my family, we just gravitated towards it inexplicably, yeah. and it was just always there. Mm -hmm. And when I was doing it, it was just that the shoe fit really right. well. Yeah. And then you're just like, yeah, like I, this is what I'm supposed to do. Mm -hmm. Right. I don't actually have like a reason why. Do you think that there is a natural instinct um, and then you have to couple that basically with training and honing in on your craft? I mean, because I, I don't, I guess I, I would never be a comedian because uh, I, I You're just, not funny. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's the first time. Shots fired. Shots fired. Shots fired. <laughs> Your turn. You're starting here. <laughs> I, I get what you're saying. I get, I get what you're asking. Yeah. I don't know. It's, it's a combination. Just a, of it's got to be a combination, yeah. right? There's that natural instinct probably to be 
uh, you know, to have a, a sense of humor. And uh, I mean, everybody has a sense of humor, though. What's the difference, right? I would say 90% of it is uh, a sense of comedy okay. in the sense that you either have it mm -hmm. or you don't. Mm -hmm. You can't teach somebody you can't. stand up. There are, I mean, how many like corporate like luncheons have you been to where like various people go up and they're like making a joke about like Susan and accounting and this girl <laughs> and everybody's just like because no, they don't get it right. they don't get yeah. the sense of timing it's, yeah. It's, yeah. it's either you have it or you mm -hmm. you really don't and uh, yeah. like eight, 80 90 percent of it is just like the natural like you understanding the flow and the rhythm and like the sense of timing and then the other 10 percent of it is just writing and honing your craft and getting better and better and better mm -hmm. at it yeah yeah, yeah. So when writing your stuff, do you go through, like take me through the process of actually thinking, okay, I had an idea about this, uh, for a joke, for an example, how do you start working on that? And how do you know when you've got it? Uh, mm -hmm. It's a combination of two things. When something really makes me angry, I will generally turn it into comedy because okay. a lot of people love when, uh, I find a lot of straight men, to be honest with you, uh, find me really funny when I'm getting mad. <laughs> and I'm like just getting really angry and like I'm, I'm ranting. Uh, and I find women uh, find me more funny when I'm doing like a play on words and I'm being a little bit more um, clever. And uh, uh, I think that whenever I go to write a joke, uh, I have to just ask myself, like, does this even make any sense? Mm -hmm. And then uh, if I think about, like, something that sounds like something else, I thought, oh, how can I spin that into a punchline? Or mm -hmm. um, a lot of, the majority of my jokes are a lot of misleads, where it's like you think I'm going to say one exactly. thing, and then right. I go in yeah. another direction. Yeah. I so, love that. love that, by Yeah, the way. well, I love yeah. that style. Like, I had huge influences growing up, like Heidi Foss and... Uh, Amy Schumer and Wendy Liebman, and they're all great and masters of that sort of technique. Mm -hmm. And uh, so if somebody says something that is, uh, uh, I, I'm, a, I'm a person where I'm very self-aware and I can, I can see the irony that like I'm sitting in and then I think, well, what would be a funny way of like acknowledging this awkwardness in like maybe an ironic way or like an opposite way mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, I, it comes from anger and it comes from a lot of wordplay. If somebody just says something that's strange, it like will spark me to write mm -hmm. a joke. Do you have a line that you draw, or yeah. is it? Does it depend on the day? Does it depend on the audience? Uh, yes, there is a line that I draw um, because. You can be a certain type of person and then do comedy and then think like, well, the audience might think that I'm like that, but I'm not that person. Mm. Uh, but ultimately, the audience, the only thing they know of you and the only impression that you're giving them are the words that you're saying. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's very important as a gay comic to not just talk about being a gay comic mm -hmm. because in the industry we refer, it's actually it's kind of sad, but we refer to it as, um, you put the adjective before your job description, like are you a gay comic or are you a comic that's gay? Mm -hmm. And the difference being that a gay comic, all they do is talk about being gay and they that's make it. jokes about being gay right. and how okay. they are not attracted to women and mm -hmm. uh, their sexual preferences and, and things like that. And uh, there's nothing wrong with that, but you do get labeled and that's the only way that you get booked and that's the only way that you get known. Ah. People have less respect for you. Wow. Just like if a uh, woman is, uh, it's like, are you a woman comic or are you a, a, a comic who just happens to be a woman? Yeah. Right, right, right. And uh, there's so many things in stand-up comedy that are just incredibly irritating and super archaic. And uh, the point of stand-up comedy is to really progress our society forward by discussing subject matter that is like taboo or inappropriate and mm -hmm. things like that, which it can be great in that sense. But if you look at any comedy club and you look at their lineup and their roster for how many headliners they have that are female mm -hmm. through an entire year, entire calendar year, you'll maybe see like three or four. It's very behind the times. Yeah. They, it's very uh, uh, a straight white man's world. Um, whenever they do book a lot of uh, African American or like Indian or uh, any other race, uh, they generally book them on the premise that all they'll talk about is race stuff because people love race jokes because they want to say them but they can't. Mm -hmm. So then they're sort of pigeonholed. Mm -hmm. So for me, the type of material that I try to avoid is just talking about 
like I am gay, and mm -hmm. I, I'm going to talk about that. I'm going to joke about that. Like that's who I am. You can't take that away from me. But at the same time, I'm not going to talk about that for 45 minutes because mm -hmm. yeah. that's just boring. Gay is not a story. Right. You know. Yeah. It's yeah. just, just like if you were to talk about how you're attracted to women for 45 minutes, it's like. Okay, let's move on. Like yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah like we that. don't need to hear about that. <laughs> He's like, I could. I could go on. I, I could. Yeah. <laughs> only, only about my wife. Yeah, okay. only go of course. On about my wife. Of course. Now, I want to go back to something you said about one of the one of the ways you write a joke is that it's something angers you. Mm -hmm. What angers you? Everyone. Yeah. Uh, Are you one of these I hate people, like in a general sense? Yeah. I mean, I'm white. I'm from the suburbs. I hate everyone. I was raised uh, to talk about people behind their back very politely. And uh, no, I, I, um, I'm one of those people where uh, I have like a lot of anxiety. I'm very neurotic. And as a result from that, I find myself to be very considerate of those around me because I am like, I don't want to be that annoying person. Mm -hmm. gotcha. And when I find other people that do not offer me that same consideration, and they are incredibly annoying and incredibly uh, ignorant to the fact that other people, like people, when you're on the bus and somebody is blasting their music for everybody to hear and you're like, oh my God, thank you so much. I really wanted to hear this new album. Like, I hate you and I hope the car flips over. Like, that right. is where a lot of my anger comes from. <laughs> because I just think like, just, Consider everybody else around you. That's where a lot of my anger comes from. Yeah. So, any local behind the scenes stories that you might want to share? Uh, the only one that honestly just like comes to mind uh, is uh, I opened for Gilbert Gottfried, oh. who is famously known as the parrot Iago in Aladdin. And he has that like graining voice and that, like the way that he talks. I and it was a impression. spot on impression. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. <laughs> like he's in the room. And uh, uh, I met him and he's, you know, that obnoxious, loud, big mm -hmm. personality. Mm -hmm. And uh, I went into the green room and I met him, bracing myself, very nervous. And he was the shyest, most quiet, reserved person wow. I have ever met. Not even just for a comic, just in general. The most quiet, reserved. I was like, you know you uh, have a show to do tonight, right? Yeah. And then when he went up and then he turned it on and he did the show and uh, it was the strangest thing because everybody just thinks of him as that big, mm -hmm. loud person. And again, like you said before, what they only know you from the lines that you, exactly. you speak, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. The impression they get. Yeah. yeah. No. I mean, what if you're yeah. having a low energy day? You've got to just turn it on, yeah, right? Does everybody oh, talk believe to me, everybody I have else? gone in hungover so many times. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But there's that saying, like, the show must go on. Sure I mean, cool. I, I think that it's the most unprofessional thing when you are uh, hungover uh, drunk, high, so whatever, sure. or even sick. Like I have almost uh, thrown up on stage before, but mm -hmm. you know, on. the my inner Tina Turner just got up there, and uh, you know, I, was, I, I could see Ike in the back. I was like, okay, but uh, I can say that. And um, uh, you know, it's one of those things where uh, before the show, but like when when we had met, you're like, I'm conserving my energy yeah. so that when we do the show. I can like really bring the thunder and uh, I, same thing. I will spend all day in bed if I'm so sick or hungover or whatever. And uh, especially when I'm hosting a show, because when you're hosting a show, you're not really supposed to be funny. You're just supposed to be likable and keep mm -hmm. everything moving along. Yeah. And uh, I have been insanely hungover because we're comics and we party at night and that's what we do. But the next day when you have that show time yeah. and people yeah. are paying 20 something bucks to see you, like I don't care how you feel, you go up there and mm -hmm. you know, get the Academy Award ready for your performance because <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I perform so many times, like so sick, it's mm -hmm. so hungover, but I faked it really yeah. hard. And you just conserve energy, and then when you go up there, it's just like, <sighs> mm -hmm. and then you just do it. Mm -hmm. is, yeah. there, is there like a, 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 a team kind of spirit with, with comics in no. Ottawa? Like, <laughs> no. There isn't. We will trample over women with babies to get to the top. Like, we don't care. It is not a team effort. It is literally, a, you're in it for yourself. People can pretend like they're there to be like the supporting role, to be your Yoda. No. Everybody is in it for themselves. Everybody, you don't do stand up as like, I don't, if somebody doesn't like my comedy, if somebody doesn't think I'm funny, I'm like, great, because I'm not doing it for you. I'm doing it for, for me. Yeah. Yeah, no, 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 no teamwork. <laughs> that being said, 
Uh, in Ottawa comedy, um, I have met some of the most supportive people along the way that really do have your uh, best interest in mind. Mm -hmm. um, and if, it, however, they will be first self-serving and then if the opportunity is not right for them, they will offer it to you. And also that being said, I've also met some of the worst human beings <laughs> from doing stand-up comedy. Mm -hmm. so. Well, it takes all kinds, right? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Tell yeah. us a little bit more about the, um, the writing process. Like when you're doing, when you're writing a routine, I guess that's what it's called. How long does that generally take or do oh, you boy. sort of over a period of like six months piece this together, piece that together mm -hmm. and um, how frequently do you update your, your routine, your writing? I mean, it's completely relative. Some okay. comics just do the same act that they've been doing since the 90s. Right. And you're like saying to them, like, you might want to drop the whole like dial up internet joke. I don't know if that's going <laughs> to hit or not. Um, but then we have. Uh, <laughs> Uh, then we have some people that are uh, switching it up all the time. It really depends on your style. Like I tend to write a bit tighter, a bit shorter. Mm -hmm. uh, so for me to fill like a 20 minute slot, that can take like a year. Um, yeah. And like you're saying, just sort of like over the course of six months, I just take this, take that. Like, I, oh, I remember that one thing. Sometimes I'll just think of a funny sentence or a funny word. Mm -hmm. Like a word that I love right now is enchanting. Mm -hmm. And if you can use that ironically in some way, how can I use the word enchanting or disenchanting? Uh, I don't, that's just a funny word to me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So then I think, okay, that's the word I like. That's how I want, I want to use it ironically. So I just kind of put it on the back burner. And then when the right moment presents itself, I'm like, I have this word as a ironic twist. And that's how I put it in. Mm -hmm. And I build it up over the course of a year. And then... Mm -hmm. I had like 20 minutes. But then that being said, sometimes I will literally just go up and try something totally different because you need, as a comic, to constantly be experimenting. Yeah. Well, and also, I guess you're reading your audience, too. And if you've got some sort of material in your routine that you're seeing that the audience is just not connecting with, you've got to probably quick, think very quickly on your feet and, and change course, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and I've done that. I uh, opened at TD uh, Place. Mm -hmm for 3,000 people, and I was gonna go up and talk about, uh, you know, I, I say this line, I'm like, I recently went on a date with an older man because I'm behind on some bills. <laughs> and uh, they were more of like a Royal Canadian Air Force, like this hour is 22 minutes right. kind of crowd. Mm -hmm. yeah. So me going up and talking about like, you know, sleeping with a senior might not uh, appeal to their demographic mm -hmm. because they are seniors. <laughs> and uh, I ended up just talking about, you know, the federal election and I talked about living in Orleans and um, mm -hmm. talking about like not speaking French and right. things that they would relate to yeah. because I, I really had to read that room because if you're bombing in front of 3,000 people, yes. like that's just awkward. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah. 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 So, so you're, have, I do sorry, have well, I do have one more question. You're working on uh, a screenplay. You mentioned that before. Yes. Not, not, not to give it away or anything. No. But this is a new. Is this uh, is this the one thing you really really want to do? Like I, the thing about stand up is you never make it as a stand up. It's one of those things where when you get really good at stand up, they're like, you know what, you would be good at acting. Mm -hmm. Like it's no stand up has just become famous from being a stand up. Amy Schumer quite arguably the most famous stand-up comedian uh, oh, in my industry was very famous, but she didn't become a household name until she did a movie. Jerry Seinfeld too, right? I mean, we're going back well, a couple much, of, yeah. but he became a household when name he, when he did his show. Exactly. Right? And that's the thing is that whenever you want to be famous and if you are, uh, if you are worth half your salt, then you have to know that you have to be realistic about the industry and mm -hmm. you have to know that if you do want to be famous and you mm -hmm. want to work as a stand-up comic, like you have to take the next step and stuff. It's, yeah. it's, it's weird though, because that's the only, stand-up is the only place that you would do that. You wouldn't be like the best at bowling and they're like, you know what you should do? Yeah. Yes. Tennis. <laughs> like it's just, <laughs> it doesn't make it any doesn't sense. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> 15 years of medical school, you should work in a yoga. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like it just yeah. doesn't make sense. Yeah. So um, I, I started writing a screenplay just in case, because yeah. um, I, I, I wrote one screenplay, like uh, I finished the whole thing as sort of like a learn, learning how to do it. Uh, it's not great, I'll be honest with you, it was, 
I, I submitted it to some things just being like, oh, like I wrote this, but didn't hear anything back. And I was not surprised because it just, it was just a learning experience. Yeah. And then now I'm actually like taking everything that I learned in a, and incorporating my comedy into it. And it is, uh, it's a much stronger. Uh, and yeah. so, I don't know, I mean, maybe something will come of it, but if there's one thing I've learned about working in this industry is never get your hopes up. Right. And uh, just never think that anybody is going to give you anything. It has to be you that, oh, yeah. that yeah. gets it. You yeah. gotta make it happen. Yeah. So tell us about the local scene. Where do you perform in Ottawa? What's that like? And uh, where would we go to see you? Um, I uh, perform, so I've sort of ping pong between Absolute Comedy and Yuck Yucks. Okay. Uh, recently it's predominantly been through Yuck Yucks because uh, every year they do their summer competitions uh, and it takes up like the whole month uh, of, so it's a whole month of stage time that like we can't book. Last year, I am proud to say that I won their competition at Absolute Comedy. So this year, uh, I can't obviously participate. So uh, I'm performing mostly at Yuck Yucks. Mm -hmm. um, and the Ottawa comedy scene is, we have produced some of the greatest comedians uh, that you know, you've heard of, like Norm Macdonald, yeah. Mike Macdonald, um, Tom Green. Mm -hmm. uh, Though I do like to say, uh, Tom Green, I loved his show. I thought it was extremely groundbreaking. As a stand-up comedian, I'm not as much of a fan of his, uh, his, uh, his aesthetic, but uh, I loved his show. Um, you know, we produce so much great talent, and then they move away, yeah. and then they become famous, and then... Later, they're like, oh, you're from Ottawa. So yeah. we, it is a really great scene. And uh, you know, we have Howard over at Yuck Yucks. He's been. Mark Breslin, who was the, the founder of Yuck Yucks, mm -hmm. is his uh, uncle. So oh. um, he sort of helped like found the company with him. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, now it has like this big national presence. And to sort of work with him and get feedback from him is just sort of an invaluable experience. And, uh, yeah, there's a lot of local talent. There's a lot of terrible comedians in Ottawa as well. So mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a nice balance. Oh, nice mix. <laughs> What about training? I mean, is there training in Ottawa, or did you train anywhere? Or what, uh, is there training for, or is it, or is it just is it just getting out there and doing your set over and over again until you? I believe Pierre Brou. I'm Pierre. butchering his name. Uh, I'm not French. Can you tell? Uh, <laughs> offers a uh, how to stand up course uh, okay. in the Glebe. Okay. of some kind. I have no idea whom his uh, alumni are or if there even are any alumni. I, I just, I think he told me about this course once. The thing about stand-up is uh, just like the, the sense of comedy, either you have it or you don't. Yeah. The thing about stand-up is you can read a book and you can learn how to, you can take a course or something, but you won't really get anything out of uh, it that would be better than actually going oh, okay. up and performing. That's the only way that you can do it. How do you deal with heckling? I'm pretty good with it. Yeah. I remember, um, this is a bit of a, uh, I don't know if I can say this, but I, the first time that I had ever done uh, a weekend show was at Absolute Comedy and I went to go open um, the show and I was like, oh, you know, I know that when you look at me, you can tell that uh, I, and this guy screams out, this is my first weekend show ever, a mm. couple months into comedy, he's like, a uh, rhymes with maggot. And uh, I stood there and I froze and I didn't know what to say. And wow. I was, that was my first weekend show ever. And uh, I just breezed right past it. And I didn't know what to do. And I awkwardly was like standing there and I was like shaking and I was so mad and I, I had nothing to say. Mm -hmm. And then when you get better at comedy, and then you suddenly get, you, you have that stage presence, you have the confidence. Um, I had many hecklers, and I uh, shoot them down very well. And I look back on that first experience, and I just think, like, I have, like, 18 things that I could say to you <laughs> now. Yes. Um, yeah. But it's a learning experience because it sucks at first, but then you kind of get, like, a a vault of comebacks and things that you can say back to them. Mm -hmm. The one that I usually do uh, to say to people is, uh, I'll, I'll, do, I'll do this on you. So just go along with it. So we've never met before. I'm on stage and you're talking yeah, a lot. You suck. Yeah, and I'll be like, oh, uh, what's your name? Uh, uh, Allison. 
gross. <laughs> and then I just. <laughs> And then Short, I just, through yeah, the bus so sweet. just, yeah. And then uh, you, you just learn to have these like quick little one liners. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, because the thing is about heckling is that sometimes the audience doesn't hear the heckler mm -hmm. and you're right. going off on someone right. and then they're not on your side and then you're coming off as right. like uh, a very unlikable person. Absolutely. Right. And if you don't have the audience on your side and you lose them, mm -hmm. it's an awkward 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've had that happen to me before where I lost it on this woman that would not stop talking. And uh, you know, it, it's like when you're trying to give, a, a, I don't know, any form of public speaking. Let's say you're giving a presentation at, at a lecture hall mm -hmm. and you have somebody in the front row that won't stop talking. Mm -hmm. And then you're like, can you stop? And then they look at you like, right. oh, it's your problem. And you're just like, I, ugh. Like, yeah. So it can, it can go either way. But it, in general, the audience is mostly on my side because you, if you repeat what they're saying mm -hmm. out loud, then everybody can hear and then you okay. shoot it back yeah. to them. Usually they're pretty good about being kicked out. Mm -hmm. uh, they have great security at uh, mm. Yuck Yucks on The Late Show for good reasons. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah I, I, I handle it pretty well. That's good. Now. Yeah. 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 Well, this is our Ottawa themed rapid fire Q&A. Okay. So we're gonna shoot you questions and you shoot the answers right back. Okay, but I'm just telling you right now, I barely know anything about Ottawa. Like I knew that in the most recent election that it was Justin Trudeau and Steven Spielberg. So just <laughs> brace yourself for my ignorance. There's no censoring in this one. <laughs> okay. Uh, All right, no, no, right, I got it, I got it. You did I got the first it. One? Yeah, so very simple. When was the last time you skated on the Rideau Canal? Uh, like in the 90s. What, and was I got, your, okay. what was your favorite park in Ottawa? Uh, the Fallingbrook Park. Okay. Um, have you ever been inside the apartment buildings? Yes. Okay. What's your favorite bar in the Byward Market? Uh, Blue Cactus. Okay. Where do you go to be recognized the most in Ottawa? <laughs> oh, that's so like, look, it's me. Um, <laughs> Yuck yucks, I guess. Right. Uh, what uh, is the last Ottawa restaurant you dined and dashed at? Never. I did it once in Oakville when I was a broke student and I forgot my wallet again. <laughs> <laughs> oh. All right, all right, we'll leave that one. What was the, uh, the name of the last establishment that you were kicked out of last? A Heart and Crown. Mm. Which one? The one in the market. Okay. I, I feel like the second part of each of these answers from <laughs> is the better, more interesting part. <laughs> I want to know why. Um, okay, what's your favorite street to streak on? Uh, definitely my neighborhood, uh, Cheever's, uh, Cheever's Crescent. Okay. I'd like to introduce myself to the neighbors in a very unique way. <laughs> Where in Ottawa was the last place you were arrested? I've never been arrested. Ah. Which area of town did you last go through a ride program successfully? Oh, going on the 174, coming up to Trim Road, and my friend had definitely been drinking. And they were like, have you been drinking tonight? And we were just shaking, and they were like, my friend was like, no. And they were like, OK, have a good night. Oh my god, we were. <laughs> I can't say, but we were very uh, lucky, let's just say, uh, because no, she she wasn't drunk, but she had a couple <laughs> drinks, and oh my god, no. I don't do, I'm not good in a crisis. <laughs> the, the correct answer for that was like, never. never. So, well, so I, now we got a lot on tape, though. I mean, you're so. asking a comment, so. <laughs> that's so uh, we give you the, you can either tell us your most embarrassing story, or you can pick an envelope and then just do what's inside of it, and it's it's just it's written there. And it's a nice, and you'll see the clouds. It's a very nice envelope. So peaceful. Very peaceful. Which what what would you like? Most, I'll just tell my most embarrassing story. Why not? Story. All, right, all right. Which one do I do? Okay. Um, okay. Well, I was in university. Uh, I worked very very hard to have like a straight A average. Um, but I also believe that you should jump on any opportunity that you can to give yourself less work. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's kind of the way that we're taught in society. <laughs> I was at uh, this uh, party at a house and uh, I went into the back and there was a keg and I'm just like mainlining it, just like getting the party started. <laughs> and uh, I look over and I see, uh, one of my professors 
with one of his students in the hot tub having an adult sleepover. And I was like, wow, there are so many things wrong with this. How can I use this to my advantage? <laughs> so I took off all of my clothes except for my underwear, and I slowly, awkwardly dipped my toe into the hot tub, and I sat in the water. And then they stopped, and they were like, um, what are you doing? I was like, I'm going to let you continue, um, but I'm going to need a favor to my professor. And he was like, what? I was like, I am not going to say anything about this. If you promise to give me an A, and I don't have to come into any more of your classes for the rest of the semester, and he said, done. So, <laughs> so I, I got out of the hot tub and I'm like pretty much like half naked and people are looking at me. I guess that's not embarrassing. It was more like gratifying, but I just was like. Sounds like it was embarrassing for the professor. I though. guess so, so I guess go. so. Um, embarrassing, okay, a really quick embarrassing story. A couple weeks ago we had somebody do repairs on my roof. Uh, I live in like a townhouse sort of like complex and we're supposed to get notice, 24 hours notice that they're arriving. And mm -hmm. I always had my window open and oh, my, yeah. yeah, I didn't know that they were coming. And uh, I heard like thumping on the roof. Yeah. And then I wake up and I uh, was completely naked. And uh, the guy that was repairing the roof walked by the window and like looked right in and like lingered, <laughs> like he just kind of was like staring at me. And like, I was staring at him and it was this sort of like, hello, is me looking? Like, I don't know, it was weird. Like, it was awkward. And then suddenly, like, I was like, oh, and then he kind of freaked out. And yeah. then, like, I waited them out right. to leave before I went and yeah. got groceries. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I called yeah. into work, like, I'm not coming in today, <laughs> OK? Because I'm not making further eye contact. That's oh. too funny. Oh my god, OK. <laughs> This was, right. this was awesome. Thank you well, so thank much. You so very I'm much looking for forward having to. Uh, yes, yeah. we're going to go take our seats. Okay. Take a minute, yeah. gather yourself. Okay, brace yourself. Yeah, yeah. It's it's be... Do what you okay. have to do okay. to prepare. <laughs> right. Be in the zone. Okay. Yeah. And then See you shortly. See you okay. Thanks, guys. No problem. Thank you. <laughs> oh. I wonder if they knew I was drunk. <laughs> Hello. Well, thank you guys so much for having me. I. Uh, I'd like to start things off sort of like a little bit of announcement, pull focus for just a second, but uh, I'm actually kind of celebrating this week because it's been very exciting for me. Uh, my boyfriend of three and a half years just proposed, which I thank you guys so much. Thank you. I really appreciate that. I said no. <laughs> wow, thank you. Gay people getting married. That is crazy. Right? Next they'll want to get into heaven. <laughs> I feel like we're in that place. Uh, we did break up, though. We did, because uh, someone sent their boyfriend a naked picture and then followed it up with, oops, wrong person. <laughs> yeah, not my finest moment. But the thing is, this is, this is really what I want to do. You know, I want to be a stand-up comedian, uh, which uh, I don't dream of being a stand-up comedian. I dream of owning a Dyson vacuum. Like, that's my <laughs> dream. Like, you know what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> but everybody's like, well, then why don't you just go out and buy one? Because I haven't earned it yet. That's why I don't go out and buy one. I have to earn my wings, right? I, uh, I want to be a stand-up comedian, uh, which is weird in the gay community, because most of us stereotypically are male nurses or hairdressers or priests. <laughs> and that is a joke that both entertains and teaches. Um, <laughs> brace yourself for this one. I actually used to be an altar server at Divine Infant Parish in Orleans, Ottawa. What? <laughs> I know, it's the final piece of the puzzle. Um, and no, OK, no, the priest did not molest me. It was the other way around. And I want that to be clear. Uh, 
I, uh, it's very important for my job to be relatable and talk about things that everybody can understand and engage with. Um, so I, I, I really want to do a good job when I'm on the road and I'm performing. So I, I thought, well, in Canada, what's a, a great icebreaker? Hockey, right? And uh, just round of applause. Who doesn't give any care to hockey at all? Anybody? Yeah, good, because I'm one of those people. These are my people. People are so invested in hockey. I wish I was. That's a great icebreaker, especially in a corporate sense. You talk about the weather, or you talk about hockey, and then bing, bang, boom, you have like a new best friend. <laughs> I was never really part of that. Uh, I am really an outsider looking into the industry. Uh, but with my own uh, sports ignorance, I am aware that the Toronto Maple Leafs are regarded as the worst hockey team in the entire NHL, right? Yeah, like if I know that you're shitty, then you're shitty because I don't know anything about the industry. Um, but people really love the Toronto Maple Leafs. I remember growing up, you know, I had friends whose parents, their entire basement was like all like decked out. They had everything that came with being a fan. They had like the trading cards and the jerseys and the shame, <laughs> everything that you would need. And uh, I just could never wrap my mind around something. It's like, why are you so in love with something that is so terrible? Like, you guys haven't won the Goblet of Fire in like 40 years. Like, it's been a while, right? And, uh, and I thought to myself, I was like, oh my God, ladies and gays, if you are looking for a partner in life, always go for a Leafs fan, right? Because they will stand by your side no matter how terrible you are. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> oh my gosh, what is this? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Sit down.